for their presence and for letting the Lord speak through them with their messages in song. If you'll turn with us today to the book of Proverbs, of course we're involved with reading the book of Proverbs for this month and for this particular day, uh, being the 18th, let's turn to chapter 18. Uh, I'm sure that you've all read it, and uh, but we'll uh, look and see what Solomon has to say from the words of wisdom. Proverbs 18 and uh, verse 24. And it reads as follows. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Our theme, of course, is wisdom. The subject is have a friend, be a friend. Have a friend and be a friend. Whenever I think of friendship, <clears throat> my mind invariably goes back to my late grandfather, and that is the late Bishop W.S. Saunders, the uh, former pastor of the church and who uh, preceded me uh, in being the pastor. Uh, he was my granddad as a grandfather of others in the church but Bishop Saunders was my friend. He was my friend. He was some 40 plus years older than myself, but he was always a friend, a friend. He was a man of integrity, uh, one well known in the community church community and uh, the city. I can remember uh, the year that I was called to the ministry in 1965 that we had elected a new mayor for the city in 65 and uh, those in this community particularly, as well as the community at large, our various churches uh, through our ministerial coalition wanted to encourage the new mayor uh, of the city. And uh, his name was uh, Kenneth Smead. And uh, he was being introduced to our community at uh, Asbury, AME Church here on the corner of uh, 18th and Chestnut. And various ministers representing various denominations were invited as well as the community at large uh, to be there. Uh, I was asked to be there to speak on behalf of the Pentecostal churches and pastors as well as some other pastors on behalf of their a particular faith group. When I got up to speak, uh, just for a few moments, I let it be known that I was representing uh, the Baptized Pentecostal Church and other Pentecostal churches, but of this church, of which Bishop Saunders, I said, uh, is my pastor, and went on to say various words uh, in welcoming and commending our new mayor. And after all of the ministers spoke, and finally the mayor got up to speak himself. As he thanked everybody for being there and speaking to hundreds of people who had turned out on that Sunday afternoon, he said, before I go any further, I have to let it be known about my relationship with this person 
uh, whom one of the ministers, and he turned and looked at me, he said, identified himself as being uh, the baptized Pentecostal church representing Bishop Saunders. He said, I want to say publicly before everybody that Bishop Saunders is the only man in the city of Louisville who can come into my office and get anything he asks for. And I thought those were such great words coming from the mayor. Bishop Saunders was alive then, uh, but in age, up in age, and unable uh, to represent himself. And so I was just really speaking on his behalf. Well, you know how that made me feel. That was my grandfather and my friend, my friend. Bishop Saunders was my best friend. When he passed, we had the service uh, in the sanctuary of the original church, and it became my charge, along with the late Bishop Ross, to deliver the eulogy. We agreed to do that together. And I remember to this day my subject for my time to give the eulogy. And I took my subject from the words of a sitcom that was on television at that time. Uh, it was about a young boy uh, who looked up to his father and I uh, believe the sitcom was The Courtship of Eddie's Father. Some of you who are old enough uh, might remember that sitcom, The Courtship of Eddie's Father, the song that was the theme of that sitcom was the one that I used for my subject, and it was, people, let me tell you about my best friend. Let me tell you about my best friend. Bishop Saunders was my best friend, my best friend. He was my best friend because uh, he was a man who always listened. He listened. He knew how to listen. And I experienced that uh, as a very young child when we, uh, as children, were growing up and living in Beecher Terrace. Uh, our family lived at 1216 Liberty Court and right across the sidewalk area uh, was Cedar Court, and granddad and grandmother lived right across that walkway uh, from our apartment to theirs. Uh, uh, when we would come to church, uh, we would always walk to church. Nobody had automobiles then. Uh, uh, we, we just didn't have it in our community that much. Uh, and Bishop Sonner was one who would walk uh, everywhere he went. Of course, we had public transportation. We had the buses. And at that time, you had to sit on the back of the bus. Uh, we had the streetcars. You had to sit on the back of the streetcars. We had taxi cabs uh, that were uh, available then. But Bishop Saunders would walk everywhere, everywhere. And uh, uh, he would ask me sometimes if I wanted to go with him. And I was so young and looking up to him that I would accompany him at various places at various times. Uh, he didn't write uh, checks to pay his bills and so forth. Everywhere he had a bill, he walked to the place and uh, paid them uh, with cash uh, so that the bills could be paid. I can remember more specifically when we would come to church. The church was located not at this particular corner, but on Madison Street, 1425 West Madison. And every Sunday morning, every Sunday afternoon, and on into the night service, service during the week, we would walk from Beecher Terrace to 1425 Madison. And when I was very little, I can remember him holding my hand as we walked to the church. It didn't matter what the weather was, uh, rain, snow, sleet, uh, hail, hot, uh, cold, we walked to church and walk back home. It just didn't, didn't matter. 
but he was a man, as we walked to church, he would always listen to me. And I can remember uh, the times he would ask, when I was old enough to start school, he would ask, uh, what did you learn in school today? What did you read in school today? What did you read about? And uh, there were times, I can remember one story in particular, that I, I, I began to tell him the story of the book that I had read. And as we got closer to the church, and he was there early enough, he unlocked the church, he said, well, I don't have time to listen to the rest of it because we have to get into church and I have a few things that I have to do, and that of which he did. And uh, church service went on, and when church service was over and we started back home again, he would get my hand and say, well, come on, let's go so we can go back home. Now, tell me the rest of that story. He was a man who would listen. He would listen, and that, that meant so much to me. He was a man uh, who would advise. He would advise. He would tell me at times about uh, some of his life's experiences, uh, some of the things that he had gone through in life, and, 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 and would always relate the fact of the blessings of God uh, during the hard times and the difficult times. He let me know of the uh, meaning uh, at all times about the Lord. And I looked up to him uh, in that regard because he was always teaching me something, always giving good advice. Oh, I didn't know it was that good advice back then. Uh, not all of it. Some of the things I was wondering, what in the world is he talking about? But he was always relating his experiences with the word of God and the teaching as he would go along. One of the things that caused me to really look up to him, of, of his knowledge of the Bible, uh, was because I was born in 1940, and uh, prior to that, there was in this area and several states, a uh, great flood had occurred in 1937, and people of his generation would always talk about the flood of 37, of how difficult it was and how devastating it was and the terrible effect that it had on the city and on the community. And uh, uh, one of the times he was telling me about his experiences and I said to him that something, uh, uh, granddad, doesn't sound right. And I was old enough to understand that, that uh, he talked about the flood and the devastating effect I said, uh, you have preached about the flood, uh, uh, about Noah and uh, the flood, and that God said he wouldn't let there be any more floods like that. I said, now how, how is it that uh, the Bible said one thing and you're talking about another? And he just keep walking, holding my hand, and, and he said, well, what you have to understand, he called me June, I was Walter Jr. He said, June, you have to understand that, that uh, there are things that the Bible says, he said, when you look at it and when you read it, it's always true, it's always true. And you're talking about the flood of 37, he said, but the flood of 37 just affected several states. The flood that happened in the book of Genesis that Noah was a part of, God said that he would not destroy the world with another flood. And, and, and because he would not destroy the world, he said, and he put a promise on that uh, by showing a rainbow uh, uh, to Noah. He said, so that's what the difference is. The Bible is talking about the flood all over the world, not about the flood of 37. And I always looked up to him. That, that just caused me from a young child. I, I, I took that in and said, this man knows the Bible. And, and he showed it to me uh, himself so that I could read that. But always giving advice. 
he was a man uh, who, who taught me uh, about having a work ethic as a young child. And it wasn't that my father wasn't around. Uh, uh, my father uh, was here, and I, I, I really didn't know my dad until after I was about maybe three, four years of age. Uh, my dad was drafted into the military shortly after I was born, and I knew his voice by telephone when he would call. I would read the letters, our mother would read them to us, uh, that he would write. Uh, but I didn't get to see him until after uh, we got just a little bit older. But granddad was always there giving his advice, and at this one point, teaching me about work ethic, uh, he knew that mother, or dad, when they did get home, would give us a little money for allowance, and you know how we as children uh, would like to have a little change rattling in our pockets, and, and, and granddad said, well, do you have enough money? We'd be going somewhere. Do you have enough money? And I said, I don't, I don't have any sometimes. I just have a little. He said, well, I'm going to help you to understand that you can get a little more money in your pocket, but you have to learn that you have to work for it. You have to work for it. And I was saying, because I think I was going to school, I know I was at that particular time, well, maybe this will get me out of going to school. If he's talking about me getting a job, I can get out of going to school. But, but that wasn't what he was talking about. He was letting me know that, uh, and showed me, he said, I'm going to give you every week a little more change to put in your pocket he said, but understand that I'm not giving it to you. You have to work for it. And what I want you to do every week, every Saturday, I want you to shine my shoes uh, so that my shoes will be shined for Sunday and for the rest of the week. That was the first job that I had was as a shoe shine boy for my granddad. And I would shine them up every Saturday night and take them across the walkway uh, to his uh, home uh, right across the way. And he would give me a little bit to put in my pocket, always advising, always teaching. He was a, a friend. He was a friend. He was one who instilled the value not only uh, for, for work ethic, but uh, for education. He said, always understand now, in spite of all of the difficulties of life that we as a people encounter, uh, he said, uh, you're, you're going to be able uh, to get somewhere if you get an education. Stay in school and learn all that you can and get a good education. He was one who was unable to have a lot of education himself. Uh, having been born uh, around the turn of the century uh, thereabout, and, and uh, parents having come out of slavery, uh, he was only able to go through a certain uh, few lower grades and had to uh, leave school, of course, and as many did at that time, and to just get a job to support the family. But he always valued education. He was a man who always read. He liked to read things, and he liked to share what he would read. So he would tell us, and he told me, get an education. Not only did he instill in me the value of a good education, he instilled in me the value of salvation. Always talking about you've got to know the Lord, and you've got to get with the Lord, that you've got to be saved one day. And I would ask him at times, Granddad, how will I know that I'm saved? Uh, you keep talking about it. I hear about it in church. I hear them singing about it. I hear you preaching about it. How will I know that I'm saved? And his words were always, you just keep praying. Just keep praying. And uh, when it happens, you'll know. You'll know. And uh, that turned out to be true. Uh, just the advice that he gave was so meaningful to me. That advice coming from a friend. He was a man who also not only would just listen and would give advice, but he was one who would confront. He would confront you. And uh, with his confrontation, he would correct you. 
Now I think of as I grew older from my childhood to young adulthood, and I can tell you the exact age that I was. I was 22 years of age when uh, granddad confronted me because I was six months away from graduating from U of L, and uh, I was recently married uh, to Sister Pat, and we were struggling, of course, as young married couples do, and, and the finances just weren't what we thought they ought to be. I still had not finished school, but I was able to get a weekend job uh, in the laboratory at Children's Hospital, working on Saturdays and on Sunday morning. Couldn't go to church on Sunday morning, but I went to church on Sunday night. Well, because of the financial situation, uh, I, I got the smart idea that uh, the Lord will understand uh, with the bills that I've got coming in and I've got to finish paying for my education and with the, 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 the difficulties, with the utilities and so forth, just got married, the Lord will understand that, that I don't have to pay my tithes uh, anymore. Uh, I'd have been taught that, I was doing that, but I stopped doing that all of a sudden. And I remember that Sunday night at church, uh, uh, Bishop Saunders' granddad said, uh, as he walked toward me, June, let me say something to you. He said, now the Lord has blessed you uh, to come through life thus far, through some difficult times and over some difficult situations, and you're just a few months here from graduating. He's given you a job. I know you've just gotten married and the difficulties that come with that, but uh, you've been forgetting the Lord with your tithes, with your tithes. He knew how to confront you how to confront you. And when he confronted me, what's the first thing we do when somebody usually confronts us? We get angry and we get upset. Our defense mechanism kicks in. Well, I got angry. I got angry. But I dare not say anything back to him. I just took everything that he said and as I drove home that night, the angrier I got, until the Lord said to me, you have a right to be angry, but it's misdirected anger. The anger ought not be against your grandfather. Your anger ought to be against yourself. And I had to take that uh, and got angry with myself because I hadn't done what I was supposed to be doing. And so I took the anger off of granddad and I thanked him for what he told me. Why? Because he was my friend. He was my friend. And one thing that a good friend will do is that friends tell friends the truth. They tell the truth. I respected him for telling me the the truth, telling me the truth. And so I got uh, my little funds together and rearranged things. And somebody else had to be late getting things, uh, financial wise, other than the Lord. Uh, the Lord had to come first. And I got back on track with that. It is good to have friends who will tell friends the truth uh, uh, to confront you. Constructive criticism is good. Constructive criticism helps us to overcome some things. Constructive criticism helps us to grow and to be better. Constructive criticism is different from destructive criticism. Destructive criticism is when somebody confronts you in order to tear you down and to push you back. But constructive criticism, we all have to learn and ought to be willing to take that. Granddad was one who would listen, he would advise, he would confront. He was a man who also knew how to comfort, how to comfort. I can remember as a, a boy, again, when I would get a whipping uh, from mother 
And uh, sometimes those whippings would come uh, not, not just because I uh, was intent on doing something bad and being corrected. Sometimes my sister Frances, and uh, 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 she, she's older than I am, and sometimes she would uh, 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 tempt me, uh, push me on uh, to join her in doing something that we ought not be doing. And of course, as we always thought we were getting by, nothing got past mother. Nothing got past mother, and nothing got past her little paddle uh, uh, when she put that paddle to work. Well, there were times after I took my whipping that I would go to granddad and he always knew how to comfort. He knew how to comfort. And the things that he would say, first of all, now, June, you've got to mind your mother and uh, mind your daddy. Always respect your parents. And, 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 and then in his comforting words, not just then, but with so many things in life, he said, now, as you're going through life, always learn how to and be deliberate in doing the right thing. Just doing the right thing. When you do the wrong thing, you're going to get a whipping sometime. But do the right thing as you're going through life. Not only do the right thing, he said, but you've got to learn how to, to pray as you're doing the right thing. And as you're moving forward, never give up on what you're doing if it's the right thing. And as you pray while you're doing the right thing, somehow the Lord always makes everything all right. And I remember those words as I was growing up and getting through life and appreciating him more because he was my best friend. Well, church, my point ultimately for you to understand and to realize is that everybody needs a friend. Everybody needs a friend. We all need a friend. And a friend being somebody who's more than just a casual acquaintance that we might have in life. All of us have acquaintances people of whom we know, that we may talk to, that we may socialize with, people we may work with, but a casual acquaintance is not necessarily a friend. We need people who are true friends. Everybody needs a friend. In other words, everybody needs somebody who will listen to you. Somebody who will give you good advice. Somebody who will confront you from time to time. And somebody who will comfort you from time to time as it is needed. Everybody needs that and we need it from a friend. So we have to be careful because we need friends. We have to be careful who we decide to make our friends. You've got to always watch out because everybody who says there's your friend, they're not necessarily your friend. As you've been reading through Proverbs up to this point, you'll find that Solomon was warning his son uh, to be careful of those who say, come join us, come join us. Uh, with the uh, intent of going after uh, uh, somebody else to do harm in somebody else's life. There are those who are saying, come be a part of our team, be a part of our group, be a part of our gang, be on our side, but it's only to hurt somebody else. Not only is it that there are those who say, come join us, Solomon also talked about the woman who had her door open, who said, not only come join us, but come to my house. And of what would happen just by coming to the house of a temptress and of a harlot. Solomon says that it brings you to the gates of hell. What he is saying is that be careful of who you call your friend. 
There are those who will get you to hurt somebody else, and then there are those who will get you just to hurt you. Oh, you know how it is that some folk, they want to know everything about you so they can tell everything about you. Put all of your business in the street and before the world. Be careful of who you call your friend. Everybody needs a friend. In the 17th chapter, just preceding this chapter we're in, and the 17th verse, Solomon says that a good friend, a friend, loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times, but a brother, he says, and a brother is born for adversity. What is he saying there is that God knows that we need earthly friends. And God has provided that when we run into adversity, that somebody has been born to be our friend. Now, I know that sometimes we think that we're, we don't have any friends. We get so alone, and, 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 and uh, we all need that. We sense that psychologically. Everybody needs a friend. God has provided somebody to be your friend. He is saying that a brother is born for adversity. Not just talking about a blood brother, but sometimes your best friend can be somebody who's not a member of your family, being a brother or a sister who's born to be your friend. That's what he's talking about. So everybody, everybody needs a friend. Solomon is also saying now, not only is it that we need a friend, but you need to be a friend. You need to be a friend. 24th verse here back in the 18th chapter says that a man who has friends must himself be friendly. He must be, or she must be friendly. Somebody needs you to love them. Somebody needs you to be a friend who will listen to them, who will advise them, who will confront them and correct them if need be, to tell them the truth. Somebody needs you as a friend to comfort them. We need a friend, but then the Lord also calls us to be a friend. And then Solomon's words here in concluding this verse says, but there also, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And we know of whom Solomon is talking about. He didn't know the name of Jesus at this point, but he was wise enough to know that God not only provides earthly friends, but above our earthly friends is a heavenly friend, one who will stick closer than a brother, closer than a brother. And of course, we know that that is referring to Jesus Christ himself. Jesus, who is a friend above all friends, a friend above everybody. Look at what John says, if you'll project that passage from the 15th chapter of John, as to what Jesus was saying here. Jesus said uh, in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus at this time is talking because he had previously listened to his disciples. He had been preparing them through the Lord's Supper and so forth as he was on his way now to the Mount of Olives 
with his disciples. Judas had forsaken him and had gone back uh, to get word to the enemies to come and arrest Jesus. But on the way to the Mount of Olives, Jesus, having listened to the disciples and their concerns, has said in the 14th chapter, comforting them as a, a friend, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus proving himself to be a friend. Look at what else he's saying as a friend. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He is saying that I have come to give my life as a friend to you, my disciples, and to all who will believe. That's what a friend does. A friend is willing to stand up to the point of being willing to give one's own life for the sake of his friends. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Look at what he said in the 14th verse. You are my friends, what? If, we talked about that word if last week just a little bit. Jesus is confronting his disciples at this time. He is saying, you are my friends, but I'm letting you know it's based on the condition, not of what you make up for the condition, but if you do whatever I command you to do, you are my friends. He went on to say in comforting them and in advising them, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing but I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father, I've made known unto you. In other words, friends tell friends the truth. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm telling you the truth. Everything I've learned from my Father, I've made known unto you. Oh, church, it's good to have a friend. It's good to be a friend, but there's no better friend Oh, than Jesus, than Jesus. Jesus is still one who's a listener. He's a listener. Jesus is one. Oh, we sing that song sometimes. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege it is to carry everything oh, to God in prayer. Jesus is a listener. We used to sing sometimes uh, when I was young, Jesus will hear you pray. Yeah. Oh, don't you know he'll hear you when you pray? He's a good listener. He'll hear you when you pray. That song says, if you trust him and always obey, Jesus will hear you pray. Jesus is one who not only is still a listener, but he's one who is an advisor. He will tell you what is right. He'll tell you what is true. He'll show you the way. That's why he said, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I'm your friend. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burdens, they are light. And you'll find rest unto your soul, unto your soul. Jesus is one who still confronts. Jesus will tell you when you're right, and he'll tell you when you're wrong. He lets us know through the Spirit of when we're going the right way or when we're going the wrong way. He'll confront us to correct us. It is the word that tells us that everybody whom the Lord loves, he chastens. In other words, he disciplines in order that they may be a better child of the king. The Lord does that. And then he also comforts us. He comforts us. And the greatest comfort, church, I tell you, that comes to me has been for many years of my life, and that's from the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples as he was getting ready to depart from this world, the sin into heaven. In the closing verses there of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus ultimately told his disciples, go therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And here's the comfort. Lo, I'm with you always, always, even unto the end of the world. Oh, church, that's a friend. That's a friend. No matter what you're going through, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That's a friend who loves you, a friend who cares about you, and a friend who will see you safely through. Oh, have a friend. Be a friend. And know that Jesus is our best. He is the best friend of all. We can have good friends and best friends here on earth. What's, how do you describe your best friends? In your te- B- BFF, best friends forever, BFF, I'm learning. And, 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 and as we have our BFFs here on earth, uh, then, then, then make it your BBFF uh, that comes down from above. Oh, the best friend in Jesus, in Jesus, the one who loves us Don't you know he loves us more than we love ourselves? He loves us that much. Paul said there in that eighth chapter of Romans that was read, uh, 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 who can separate us from the love of Christ? He just loves us that much, wants to be our friend, wants to be our friend. Shall tribulation or distress, our persecution or famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword. Shall these things separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, can we go through these things and have uh, the Lord not notice? Uh, Don't we know when we go through these things, he doesn't separate himself from us. Just because we are having these terrible experiences sometimes in life, Paul said, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. For he said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor nor powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall separate us from the love of God, which is through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh, so let us be thankful that we have a friend who is more than just a brother. He is our greatest friend, our holy friend, and that is Jesus. So as we continue to read through Proverbs, pick up on those things that Solomon is saying, so many things, and uh, you're learning something every day as you read these various chapters. Uh, The greatest thing, uh, one, is that the Lord uh, still saves, and the door is still open uh, to salvation, that if there's any here today who would desire to come to Jesus, the invitation is extended to you. If you've not given your life to the Lord, the door is open for you. The invitation is being extended. We're saying the words on behalf of the Lord. Come, come to him. Come to him today, repenting of your sins, turning from them, being godly sorrowful, asking the Lord to forgive you. And if you mean it, he will. He still does. The blood that he's already shed for us is still available today. The power in the blood to cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. We're going to have two of our officers to stand here and one on each side. And if there's anyone to come to give your life to the Lord, let these know, one of these officers know, And they will inform you as to what to do from there as you give your all in all, your life, your heart, your soul to Jesus Christ our Lord. 
He is still in the saving business. He's trying and endeavoring to lead us away from hell, but to guide us and direct us and to take us into life everlasting with him and with the Father and with the angels in glory. Won't you come? If you're here without a church home, maybe you've given your life to the Lord, but for some reason have gotten away from the church, or, uh, uh, got lax, or whatever happened, but you, you want to rededicate your life to Christ. Won't you come and we'll receive you because of your rededication? And if there's any desiring prayer, whatever your needs may be, won't you come? Let us stand and while the choir sings. If there's one, if there's more desiring to come to give your life to Jesus, to acknowledge that you want to be a Christian, you want to be a follower of Christ, you want to be a disciple, or if you desire prayer, won't you come, won't you come?